regrets, no confusion, there'll be no pollution. I'm so thankful I've decided to change my ways. Welcome back to the Leaving Eden podcast. Happy New Year to all of you. Well, happy 2024. Life will be so much more. My name is Gabriel Hakohen. And I am cult survivor, cult expert, Sadie Carpenter. Today, we are going to do our traditional first episode of the year, where we talk about a very specific cult. Um, I think last year we did Jonestown and the People's uh, Temple. And the year before that, we did the Branch Davidians in Waco, Texas. This year, we're doing one that isn't quite as heavily Christian based, but it's like slightly Christian influenced. This is something I was I was not planning on covering this group because I had never heard of this group at all. And I wasn't really planning on doing a totally different cult episode for the first episode of 2024. But my husband, Jonathan, found this cult on Wikipedia. And he sent me the Wikipedia article and he said, hey, you should cover this cult. I was intrigued because it's not every day that I hear about a cult that has this number of members that is completely new to me. That's an unusual experience from right from the start. So I opened the article he sent me and the first sentence that caught my eye is that they mixed um, Buddhist, Hindu and Christian religious beliefs. That immediately led me to ask, what, OK, what Christian beliefs, which ones? <laughs> To which the answer is not so much the Jesus ones, more the hell and end times ones. And from there, I was just hooked. I found so much information. I was unstoppable at that point. I had to find out more about this group. This is a very interesting group, and I'm glad we get the opportunity to talk about it. The group that we're talking about is called Om Shinrikyo. Um, you may know them because they did a chemical weapons attack on the Tokyo subway in 1995. They uh, dropped a bunch of sarin gas in the subway system in Tokyo. It was it was a very horrible terrorist attack that happened back in the 1990s. The thing that stood out to me about this cult was the startling similarities between um, Om Shinrikyo. Uh, we're going to call them Om for a lot of the... We're going to use Om and Om Shinrikyo... Uh, interchangeably because that's what people tend to do when they're talking about them. Um, but there's a lot of similarities between them, between Jonestown, between the Manson family cult. And for reasons that we're going to get into, I think that this cult can also be possibly a gateway for us to get into talking about some like new age spirituality based cults, as well as some of these cults that tend to maybe repackage traditional medicines and uh, what they would describe as ancient wisdoms as methods of coercive control. Yeah, it's got all of that. It is also just a wild story, and I'm really excited to get into it. It's extremely fascinating. I I was just hooked reading all about this. I listened to so many podcast episodes about it, and I read so many sources about it. It it was it, it was a fantastic deep dive, and I'm glad that we get to share this with you. Um, but before we get into that, the Leaving Eden podcast is the podcast about my BFF and co-host Sadie Carpenter's life in and escape from the Independent Fundamental Baptist Cult, also known as the IFB, which is the cult that she was raised in. We talk about this cult. We talk about other cults. We talk about religion. We talk about fundamentalism. We talk about the real and present threat that cults and cult ideologies pose to society as a whole. And it is our goal to promote freedom of mind, freedom of thought, and freedom of religion. So if you like our show, if you are a fan of our show, then there are things that you can do to support us. You can support us over on Patreon at patreon.com slash leaving Eden podcast. And on here, there is an extended and uncensored and ad free version of today's episode, as well as many of our other episodes, most of our other episodes. And they also come out a couple of days early. So if you just can't wait to get that new episode, then you can listen to it over the weekend instead of waiting for Monday morning. You can also join our Facebook group, which is facebook.com slash groups slash Eden Exodus. Um, great place to have discussions. 
um, you know, share memes, talk about religion. Some of the discussions are like, you know, from people deconstructing. So that's a great space to do that. But some of it just tends to be lighter and just us like poking fun at religion and, you know, just ta- sharing our different beliefs and stuff. So that's a really cool place. Also, we have a subreddit, reddit.com slash r slash Eden Exodus. Sadie, do you want to thank our patrons and give us the TW? I can do that. Our I gave it all to your patrons are Kathleen Moncrief, Melora King, Melissa Mosley, and Todd Dale on behalf of his deconstructorina wife, Madeline Antrim. Thank you guys so much. Our Faith Promise Missions tier patrons are Alex P, Ali Allen, Autumn of Our Discontent, Brittany, Krissa Walker, Dan the Trans Man, Dora J. Eleanor Donahue, Hannah Ross, Hannah Montana, Hoosier X Fundy, Hope Norum, Horton Hears a Shane, Janine Callen, Jen Kaharski, Jessica Tambo, Jonna, Kat Hinwood, Kay Terwee, Kristen Marie, Linda Morgan, Lindsay Goss, Madeline Antrim, Madeline Cusick, Marlena Stuve, Marcia Millard, Mary Williams, Mary Martin, Megan Arndt, Melissa G., Rob the Methodist, Stephanie Johnson, Steve and Amy, Susie, Tara McNamara, and Wes the Cowboy. Thank you guys so much for supporting us at the I Gave It All and Faith Promise Missions tier levels of our Patreon. And thank you to all of our patrons and just anybody who listens to our show, supports our show, shares our show with your friends and family. We couldn't do what we do without you. Yeah. We are, of course, so, so thankful for the people who contribute financially to the show. But there are lots of ways to support us and what we're doing here. And we have the show that we have because of our audience. Thank you so much. In general, we talk about a lot of potentially triggering topics on this show, including but not limited to suicide and mental health, racism, misogyny, PTSD, PTSD symptoms, child abuse, mental, physical and sexual abuse and spiritual abuse, including guilt, shame and fear. In most episodes, we will mention at least a few of these topics, but we try very hard to avoid graphic detail unless it's necessary to the story that we're telling. If we are going to go into graphic detail, we will give you a heads up right before we do so people can skip if necessary. This episode contains... (coughs) Sorry. This episode contains discussion of terrorism, chemical weapons, lots of murder, Specific cult tactics, electroshock therapy, brainwashing, and a little bit of gross-out body horror. The body horror stuff is really only one section, and we will excessively warn you before we get there. There is also a very brief discussion of child murder and execution with no details given on either one of those things. On the morning of the 20th of March, 1995, at the peak of rush hour... Subway commuters in Tokyo, Japan, fell victim to a chemical attack. Five people entered subway cars carrying packages wrapped in newspaper, as well as umbrellas with a special sharpened tip. At planned subway stops, the perpetrators dropped their packages, punctured them using the tips of the umbrellas, exited the trains, and entered cars driven by waiting getaway drivers. The packages had been filled with liquefied sarin, a deadly and highly reactive nerve agent that quickly evaporates when exposed to air, endangering anybody nearby. An enclosed space like a subway car is the worst case scenario for an attack like this. Not only were passengers who were directly exposed to the liquid affected, but so were the subway workers, first responders, and bystanders who went to help. A total of 12 people were killed immediately. Another died the next day. And in 2020, another woman who had been incapacitated by the attack and bedridden for 25 years died, bringing the total number of deaths to 14. More than a thousand suffered serious injury and more than 5,000 were treated at hospitals with milder symptoms. Some with milder symptoms went to work and only left to go to the hospital after seeing news of the reports of the sarin gas attack. Did you ask your parents or anybody a little, just a couple years older than you in your life, if they remembered this? No, I didn't. I I mentioned what I was doing for this episode to my mom and she goes, oh yeah, I remember that. We So we would have been, I would have been just barely two and you were almost two when this happened. But my mom remembered this 
And my husband remembered this because he would have been eight years old or all, or seven and a half. So he remembered seeing this on the news. I remember reading about this in, I want to say like the Guinness Book of World Records. You know, they'd have a section where it was like, oh, biggest toenails or something or longest, like or tallest person. Mm-hmm. But then they would have a section where it was um, deadliest ke- chemical weapons attack something like that and i remember seeing it oh and it was like the tokyo subway and i didn't really understand what a cult was and i didn't really understand what the religious group behind it was little did you know that (laughs) at 30 years old you'd be besties with a cult survivor and talking about lots of weird cult stuff on a medium that had not yet been invented um i don't really think people had podcasts back in or maybe some people did back in like 2004 2005 Do you want to tell us about, so we need to rewind in time to the mid to late 1980s and talk about the group, the formation of the group that did these attacks. Do you want to tell us about the leader? Yeah. So the leader was a man who went by the name Shoko Asahara. But that wasn't the name that he was born with. He was born with uh, he, he was born as Shizuo Matsumoto. He was born in 1955. He did not come from a wealthy family. His older brother was almost completely blind and attended a school for the blind. Matsumoto's vision was nowhere near as bad as his brother's, but it was poor enough to also attend the school as well. His family chose to send him there because his education would be subsidized and he would be provided with free meals. Being the most sighted person at the school gave him the ability to manipulate and control and coerce other children into doing his bidding. He earned a black belt in judo and could engage in physical violence with impunity and extort money from his classmates. Not a great dude. Um, A teacher at the school was anonymously quoted as saying, um, and I'm reading this quote here, when the guidance counselor tried to do something about it, Asahara said, all I did was say I would set a fire. It was just words. There's nothing for you to get all upset about. And you know what else he'd say? I'll shoot you to death. After saying that, he would say, as long as I don't really shoot you, it's not against the law. I can say whatever I like. When he'd talk that way, the teachers were surprised and would say, it's scary. What will happen in the future? I remember well that there was talk like this. So even at a young age, his his teachers and his classmates had to deal with somebody who was very well, who was seen as being somebody who had displayed antisocial behavior. And that's really sad that he would be the person with the most ability to see among himself and his classmates. Not everybody would choose to use that to be super helpful to other people. But it's really sad that he chose to use it to be the worst possible version of himself. Right. I mean, if you're in that situation, you could be the person who says, here, I can see the best out of everybody. Let me help you with that. Yeah. And I don't really feel like it's fair to expect somebody who is disabled to go that extra mile and be the best possible, most virtuous version of themselves. I think that can be a a trope when we talk about disabled people that's not helpful, but I do think it's fair to expect him not to be the worst possible version of himself. Yeah. And I mean, if you're just being a person who sees, oh, I have an advantage over other people, let me use that to the worst possible ends. Yeah, that's a really cruddy choice. Even as a child, that's pretty... Matsumoto was powerful among the children, and he would often strike up friendships with social outcasts in order to bring them into his circle and turn them into his minions. So he was clearly a person who desired who desired power over others, who desired status. Some who knew him described this desire as an obsession. He unsuccessfully ran for class president. He told his classmates that one day he would be prime minister of Japan. However, he was rejected from Tokyo university when he applied to study politics. Following this failure, he spoke of a desire to enter a career in medicine, but he failed his college entrance entrance exams so he instead turned to practicing acupuncture which was a common career choice for the blind in japan around this time this behavior of 
sort of wanting to do something grandiose and then failing at it for basically being unsuited to it and then pivoting to something else is a common theme. And it was around this time that he changed his name to Shoko Asahara. So this brings us to the early 1980s when he opened up a traditional Chinese medicine shop. However, rather than selling traditional herbal remedies, he allegedly made hundreds of thousands of dollars selling what was essentially snake oil. It was made from like orange peel and alcohol, and he promised traditional Chinese remedies. But in 1982, he was arrested and fined by the Japanese government for selling fake medicine. He was also selling like drugs, drugs. Yeah. But no actual traditional Chinese medicine, just fake medicine and like MDMA. Despite his arrest and his con artist behavior, Asahara had built up a loyal customer base. Maybe it was the MDMA. Around this time, he began (laughs) practicing yoga. And according to his contemporaries, he was quite good at it because he had a background in judo, which lent itself well to yoga because he had excellent body control and excellent breath control. In 1984, Asahara traveled to India and to Nepal to study Hinduism and Buddhism, and he met with the Dalai Lama and had his picture taken with the Dalai Lama as well as other religious leaders, and he then used these pictures to bolster his reputation back in Japan of being a highly respected spiritual leader. So I found the picture of him with the Dalai Lama. It was not easy, but I did find it. Um, We will post that on our Instagram. And the Dalai Lama eventually really regretted this picture. But we'll get to that. I kind of feel sorry for for him. If I were the Dalai Lama, I would say, get that off the internet. Scrub that. Like... Yeah, he, he he eventually did like the 1980s version of that. I mean, but this reminds me of a lot is, you know, the Scientologist practice where they will write form letters to cities or towns or governments or, or municipalities and ask them to affirm the way of happiness so that they can mm-hmm. put them up in their like hall of proclamations to give them some sort of institutionalized praise to help convince people who that appeals to that they're kind of legit yes this i sort of see as the same way where he's saying these are spiritual leaders i have my picture taken with them therefore i'm also a spiritual leader uh it's kind of just like the spiritual version religious version of like clout chasing so that same year that he traveled to India and he traveled to Nepal. He incorporated his company called Aum, which was based on a Sanskrit word initially to sell yoga classes and health beverages. And his popularity grew due to Asahara's ability to market himself as a guru, as a spiritual leader who was well-respected and wise beyond his years. However, it didn't really start to transform into a religious sect until sometime around 1987. 1987 is when the group that was later called Om Shinrikyo uh, was founded in Asahara's apartment, and it began as a series of yoga meetings. Originally, his name for the group was Omu Shensen no Kai, which translates roughly in English to Om Immortal Mountain Wizard Association. Do you want to join the Immortal? That sounds very (laughs) cool. That's a cool name for a cult. I would join the Immortal Mountain Wizard Association. That's, uh, I mean, I would have that certificate on your wall. That's. I know. If it, if it only, it weren't a seriously abusive death cult. That's a very cool name for a cult. As Immortal Mountain Wizard Association morphed into a religion from just being a yoga meeting, it got the reputation of being a religion for the wealthy. It attracted a lot of university graduates and other high status people. I almost got the vibe that this was a sort of luxury religion. Almost as like you you live in Oregon. I'm from Oregon. You live in Oregon. Do you know, like, the trust fund kids who will pay $40,000 to do an ayahuasca retreat and then come back and lord it over you as if they're somehow, like, a better or more enlightened person than you because they did drugs in the jungle that one time? I know the type, yeah. Sasuma Oda, um, and I'm reading another quote from, I believe this is from a a New York Times article, which we're going to have linked in our sources. 
Susuma Oda, a professor of psychopathology at the University of Tsukuba, suggests that one attraction of cults is that they offer young Japanese their first real father figure because their own fathers were never home when they were growing up, but instead were always at the office. Professor Oda also says that religious sects in Japan are to some extent the equivalent of the drug culture in America, offering people relief from stress and the opportunity to develop creative powers. Interesting. Yeah, that's a very interesting take. My understanding is that new religions grew in popularity in Japan during this time as a response to the materialism that came with Japan's economic boom throughout the 1980s. So rather than being writers and creatives and like go to Burning Man, but they're like the burnout kids from wealthy families, you know the type? Yeah. Yeah, rather than doing that, you're going to join a religious cult. So Ohm presented itself as both counterculture, but like an elite version of counterculture. It's like a, like an industry plant punk band. Mm. And in this sense, it's like inherently contradictory. But they kind of got around this by claiming that their members could learn supernatural powers like levitation. I also see here that there are some parallels to Scientology in that Ohm claimed to use technology to enhance the spirituality of their members, including using special helmets, which would align the brainwaves of members. And these treatments, just like in Scientology, are expensive, and members who would undergo these treatments um, would be expected to donate large sums of money. The the electrode caps gave me a nice moment of humor um, when researching this very dark cult. Um, so if if you were a full time member, you could get an electrode cap for free. Uh, part time members had to rent them for seven thousand dollars a month, um, or buy one outright for seventy thousand dollars. Wow. Um. <laughs> So I, I think that was an incentive to become a full-time member. And what they were for was they supposedly gave the members the ability to receive Asahara's thoughts or his his mental vibrations that would bring you a higher level of enlightenment. Uh, there was also this thing called the Astral Teleporter, uh, which was a yoga mat that was connected to Asahara's yoga mat through electric wires. And he said that it allowed members to record the vibrations of the master's mantras and clean their astral dimensions through the master's mantric vibrations. That's from uh, an archived article from crimelibrary.com. No word on exactly how much the yoga mats cost. No, but I mean, $7,000 a month for... And this is $7,000 a month in like the early, late 80s, early 90s. So I don't know how much that is adjusting for, but that's so much money. If your members are all like rich kids, like trust fund kids. Right. And doctors and scientists, Alm's version of evangelism was passing out pamphlets that were printed by their own publishing company. It, side note, it's very interesting how cults always want to have their own publishing company because um, it gave me very strong J. Frank Norris vibes. Or Scientology. They, they had multiple in-house publications and they published sermons by Asahara that attached popular themes and ideas from anime and manga that were, that were popular in Japan at the time and then attached that to Om's um, religious ideas. So you can find like comic books that have Asahara as a superhero kind of figure. And it's about how Om's religious ideas will let you be a space superhero. I mean, Tim and Jim are yeah. Jack Chick <laughs> and his friend, Fred Carter, like self insert superheroes. Yeah. It's very Tim and Jim. And it's, it's, Another thing that I have not researched a ton about, other cults do this, but it's not my area of expertise, this blending of fantasy and reality or this blending of sci-fi and reality in with religion. I found (laughs) some of these comic books on eBay, by the way. I'm not paying $100 for it, but it was kind of cool that you can still find them. 
Do you have any panels from them that you can send me that I can look at right now? Yes. Uh, I texted you one yesterday. Let me see if I can just find it and forward it back to you real quick. This is strange. This is like very hyper realism. You know, the the hyper realist idea that the person who that the person in media, like their version of themselves is indistinguishable from that person in real life. It's this is so strange. Yeah, I think there's probably a cultural piece that I'm missing here because what I wasn't able to really understand was how seriously are these comics supposed to be taken? Because when we read uh, the Chick comics, the Tim and Jim comics, we are meant to understand uh, within American culture and Christian American culture that Tim and Jim are not real people and their adventures are fictional. Jack Chick wants us to believe that things like this happen all the time. And sometimes he'll go so far as to say this is an actual thing that real happened that really happened, but Tim and Jim weren't there. Right. And then um, people like you and me go to try to find out if it really happened. And often it did not, probably. You know, when you watch like a World War II movie and it'll have like a real battle in it, but the characters that were in the battle, maybe they're based on real people, but they're not real people. Mm-hmm. And that's the American cultural understanding. I'm sure that there is something in Japanese culture that would give more context to these comics. I just wasn't able to find it on English speaking internet in the time I had to prepare this episode. It's, it's still very weird. I don't know. I get the feeling like the, even in Japan, this is a weird thing to do. I have no doubt. Well, we'll get into what yeah. society is a whole thought <laughs> of this cult, but I want that it's important context for how they attracted the people that they attracted because Lots and lots of real scientists were attracted to this cult. There were also some religious leader or um, political leaders and members of the police that were attracted to this cult. And I always think it's important to talk about how people got in because it helps bust the stigma that cult members are stupid. There, there is a reason. So, to an outsider, Om may have appeared like any other pseudo-religious wellness cult. They told members to prioritize more important things over leisure. They claimed that physical illnesses could be cured by following the cult's extensive health rules, and they promoted positive thinking. I think maybe an initiate wouldn't feel so positive about the positive thinking when they got to the initiation ritual. Initiation rituals could include things like being forced to take LSD uh, or being hung upside down or being shocked with electrodes. The, The initiates were told that these activities were a type of yoga. If you've heard the Behind the Bastards episodes on the first American yoga cult, this might sound familiar as well. People claiming that All kinds of things are yoga in order to coerce other people into doing them. There are credible reports of sexually coercive behavior against female recruits. So women who left Ohm reported being summoned late at night for one-on-one sessions with Asahara, during which he would ask them prying sexual questions, ask them to remove their clothes, Uh coerce them into sex. And then demand that they not tell anybody. Yep, that sounds like any one of a dozen cult leaders. And also the guy in the first American yoga cult, if you have heard those Behind the Bastards episodes. We see a lot of very classic cult behavior throughout the existence of um, like sleep deprivation, food deprivation, financial dependence. Members were expected to donate all of their money and possessions to the group upon joining and becoming a full-time member. And then we're also expected to tithe any on any further income that they had after becoming a member. People who were non-compliant or fell asleep during lessons could be punished by being locked in a small room and having Asahara's teachings played at full volume. See the Lester Roloff schools. Um also did a lot of kidnapping and murder. If a member escaped, they left the group 
and couldn't be coerced to come back or talked into coming back, they would just send a group to kidnap them back. There was a lot of kidnapping. This is so fascinating because the methods of controlling the members are so textbook, but the cult's activities and its beliefs are a lot more unusual. This one just, it just hooked me, man. I mean, they were very blatant about it, too. It wasn't even just like a soft power kind of thing. It was like, a, if you do this, this will happen to you. Yep. We are going to drug you and kidnap you and put you in a jail cell. That is what we do. Mm -hmm. So during the rise of Om between 1987 and 1989, Asahara called back to his pilgrimages in the early 80s and his meeting the Dalai Lama. He told his followers that during these pilgrimages, he had had a divine experience with Shiva, a Hindu god, and had received divine enlightenment. And that because of those divine enlightenment experiences, he was called to preach real Buddhism in Japan. You know, like how the IFB and other fundamentalist groups will tell you that they are preaching real Christianity and everybody else has a corrupted version. And then you find out years or decades later that the version that they had was not inherently more faithful to the religion or more valid than anybody else's. Uh, but that's exactly what Asahara did. I'm here to teach you real Buddhism. So this is what I was talking about with the Dalai Lama severely regretting having ever taken a photo with Asahara because Asahara just milked that for everything it was worth and used it to support his own legitimacy. Why don't we take an offering break and then we can come back and talk about what uh, Om Shinrikyo's actual religious beliefs were. That sounds great. Does that sound good? Perfect. Hey, Sadie here. If this is your first time listening to the Leaving Eden podcast, make sure you go back and check out episode 57. It's a primer episode for new listeners. That episode tells my personal story and gives you all the terms and information that you'll need to know going forward. Also, check out our cult true crime series, The First Family of Fundamentalism, so that you can get the whole cult story. If you like our show, you can support us by joining our Patreon, where we have extended and uncensored episodes, as well as other bonus content available. You can also join in the discussion in our Facebook group, that group is called Eden Exodus. Tell a friend, tell a family member, tell your worst enemy. The Leaving Eden podcast is a fully independent podcast, and we really appreciate your support. Now, back to the show. We are back from our break. We're talking about Om Shinrikyo, uh, the Japanese cult that did the 1995 Tokyo subway sarin gas chemical attack. Um, and We've up to this point, we've talked about their early years, their rise, um, Shoko Asahara, their leader, uh, his early years and his rise to power. Um, and now Sadie's been doing a lot of research about their doctrinal beliefs. So why don't you fill us in on what those were? So previous to 1989, Om Rikyo's beliefs were mostly Buddhist thoughts about enlightenment, self-improvement and the role of the mortal body in the spiritual world. One concept that pops up a lot in different types of Buddhism is the idea that you train or discipline your physical body, and that is one step on the path to spiritual enlightenment. The, it, the teaching that he is taking from Buddhism is their particular beliefs about how your physical body is connected to your soul. But the deities that he led his followers to worship were borrowed from Hinduism, so particularly Shiva. And that's after 80, 1989, he added more Christianity. Before 1989, it was just a tiny little bit of Christianity. Like I said at the top, not so much the Jesus part, uh, but the ideas of a more binary heaven-hell afterlife and most importantly, the idea of the coming end times. So quick trigger warning, we are going to be talking about end time stuff, but, but not a lot of detail. So at this point, 1989 and earlier, Asahara taught that 30,000 people needed to be saved through his teachings. And if 30,000 people were saved by his teachings, that would be enough people to save the world and prevent the apocalypse from coming. This does echo Christian beliefs, um, like the belief about the 144,000 witnesses, for example, 
or it could even mm-hmm. be seen to echo some stories from the Hebrew Bible, like Abraham bargaining with God to spare the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah if there were enough righteous people there. It's not directly lifted from those stories, but it's very similar. According to the BBC, Asahara quote, declared himself to be both Christ and the first enlightened one since Buddha. Where he claimed to be Jesus, Asahara said that he was able to take the sins of the world upon himself, take his followers' sins away, and give them spiritual superpowers. Of course, the spiritual superpowers that he was referencing were earned through compliance with the things that we were talking about earlier. High-tech gadgets, Uh, electroshock sessions, taking drugs, being hung upside down, giving financial control to the cult, obedience to Asahara and other leaders, that kind of thing. Side note, there is a lot to cover here. I don't want to get unnecessarily detailed on things that could trigger somebody. But if you want to know, go look it up. This cult was really, really into all things regarding electroshock stuff. Asahara thought that shock therapy could be used to essentially create zombies. He was really interested in the idea of mind control. And he blatantly experimented on members to see how many shocks it took for them to forget a certain thing that happened or even forget their own name. I won't go into more detail than that because I feel like that could be triggering to some people. But if it interests you... There are places in my sources that you can go find more. It's it's a uh, something. The thing that seems wild to me is how prolific the drug use was and how prevalent that was. Just because of of what I know about Japanese society and how drugs are treated in that country, all drugs are extremely, or, or at least during this time, I believe, were extremely illegal. Like any drugs, any psychedelics, even marijuana, because I think marijuana had the um, it was heavily associated with the Yakuza and organized crime. So was Om Shinrikyo, but we'll get to that. (laughs) In 1989, Om Shinrikyo got legally recognized as a religion in Japan. The Japanese constitution guarantees freedom of religion and bars the government from giving preferential treatment to one religion or another. Freedom House gives Japan a four out of four on religious freedom. So good uh, good country for religious freedom. While most of Japan is not extremely, extremely religious, there are a lot of cultural, there is a lot of cultural influence from Buddhism and Shintoism and the religions other than those are generally respected. So Buddhism and Shintoism have thousands of different sects, like literally thousands and thousands of different sects. And from my understanding, each new sect gets registered with the government and that makes them a quote official religion. And there are some, I want to say 200,000 official religious organizations registered in Japan, but most of them are just like an individual Buddhist or Shinto shrine or temple that operates independently however in order to officially register there are bureaucratic processes and there was apparently considerable resistance to om getting its official designation from from local officials in tokyo i would liken this to how in the united states your independent or non-denominational church that doesn't have like an over arching denomination would register as its own 501 C three with the government. And if a religious group or like a private company is found to be a criminal enterprise then they can lose their protected status as a religion. Okay. Yeah. I had questions about that, but the way you explained it made it make sense for me in the U S uh, even churches that are seen as socially unacceptable churches that are really hateful or really misogynist or really homophobic can still register as a 501c3 as long as they're not carrying out criminal behavior or breaking other rules like specifically endorsing political candidates is the the best known of those 501c3 rules and if a 501c3 organization gets caught doing criminal behavior or breaking the rules, they can lose the ability to register as a 501c3 nonprofit and have to pay taxes. Om was making money through a lot of different streams of income all over the spectrum of legal, 
but shady to illegal and um, ethical to unethical. It's really something. Members, like I said, members were expected to donate everything they owned upon joining and tithe on new income. Om sold uh, videotapes and books. They hosted seminars and meetings, and they even owned a chain of restaurants at one point. Wow. Yeah. I kind of want to know what, like, what, what kind of restaurant I was it? Was it? Uh, <laughs> did not get that answer, unfortunately. They sell Buddha burgers. I don't know. I I will tell you about some other stuff they sold, but this is where I do have to give a TW for some gross stuff and some blood stuff. Just ooh, it'll be quick and it'll be over. Asahara uh, personally brought in a bunch of money for the cult through various personal activities. So members could receive a personal blessing where he would put his hands on their heads and bless them for $350. Um, A personal blessing would bring you closer to enlightenment, enlightenment, but also it would make you better at board games. Wow. Yeah. So great for the Mormons. Yes. Um, And and the Baptists. Yeah. (laughs) If you're Mormon, that's the best $350 that you ever spent what about uno uh i don't know you might need a specific uno (laughs) blessing um you could also just buy his beard hair for 350 dollars per half inch it was suggested that you steep his beard hair into a tea and drink it or you or you could buy his bath water for 800 dollars a quart 800 dollars a quart Wow, that's right. Eight, so, who was it that was selling? It was it was that gamer girl bathwater. Th- How much was she selling? It? it was yeah, some Twitch streamer. I don't know, but I don't think she was doing quartz. Hold on, let me look this up. So, hold on, let me type this up. What was her name? Her name Bell what, something, I, I think. Bell. Okay, I'm googling it. gamer girl bathwater. Okay, so it says here. Belle, oh, Belle Delphine was her name. Okay, she's, well, she looks nice. She has pink hair um, and, like, cat ears, um, and she's winking at the camera in this article. It says, Delphine 19, who has global blah, 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 she would be selling $30 bottles of bath, wor- bath water for all you thirsty fa- thirsty gamer boys. So, she was only selling her bath water for $30 a bottle. I don't know how many bottles are in a quart. Yeah, but I think they were tiny bottles. Oh, okay. But still, she's not getting 850 800 a quart. Or $800 a quart, especially in, like, what, 1989 money? Yes. That's th- so $30, eight, 1989 money, that's, like, a lot more. Yeah, she also... She also, one last trigger warning for blood and gross stuff. She also wasn't letting people drink her blood for money either. Jesus. What, Asahara wait. was. Uh, yeah. Ooh. He would hold rituals where followers could drink a small amount of his blood for about $7,000. Mm. There's the classic Gavi noise. <laughs> this is upsetting to me. I just want to know how much money... All of these different, like, act beard selling and blood selling activities brought in because if there were a lot of people who were doing it, you're selling electric helmets, you're selling electric yoga mats, you're selling bath water and beard and blood. And that's all that could be a lot of money. I don't know, man. This is this is all really sketchy. Yeah. And the thing is, you could also. Like beard hair, how do you know it came from him? Bath water, how do you know? I mean, if it's beard hair, dude, I bet dude was selling his pubes. Yeah, or his followers' beard hair for a less gross alternative. Um, that would be totally possible. And bath water, gosh, there's an unlimited supply of that. Um, also manufactured and sold illegal drugs. They were partnered with the Japanese mafia for some of their less legal endeavors, including murder for hire. And I am not 100% sure on this next thing. My understanding is they let their members do murder for hire for the mafia to make money. And also they would hire the mafia to do murders for hire for them. I really, I think what the article was saying was that the murder for hire went both ways, but I am just not a hundred percent sure. Oh, that makes sense. So it's like Murder Incorporated. They, yeah. In New York City. 
They also had a computer company for a while and made computers. They have, I mean, they they have their fingers in a lot of it. They're like, uh, it's like Hitachi. Yeah, they were they were kind of doing a lot. It makes a lot of sense that there would be resistance on behalf of the local government to give Om Shinrikyo the qualification to be an official religion because it really just seems like they're a criminal syndicate. Who is also doing legal activities and legal activities that are just shady. Yes. Throughout <laughs> this time, it should also be said that Om was – they were treated with – skepticism and downright hostility by many people doing due to like the publicization of their controlling tactics but despite this asahara was very outwardly respected by other religious leaders either due to japan's culture of respectfulness or due to fear of blowback and and actual physical violence or yeah, or just getting murdered, which yeah. we're just about to get to. Yeah, because um, they had a very disturbing tendency of silencing dissidents through violent means, which we're going to get to. Yeah, they were also bribing members of government, but it's not what you think. According to the incredibly helpful article, Faith, Fanaticism, and Fear, Om Shinrikyo, The Birth and Death of a Terrorist Organization, by Erica Simons in the journal Forensic Examiner, Om would call up local Japanese officials in a city or an area where they did not currently have operations and say, hey, you need to pay us a bribe or else we are going to come set up operations in your city. So it's not... What you would initially think when you hear bribe, they were regarded poorly enough that local officials didn't want them in town, so they would pay cash bribes to Om um, to keep them out of their town. I mean, if I were a local official, I would do that every time. Yeah, sounds like some of those local officials knew what was up. Yeah. <sighs> October 1989, we're going to get to the Sakamoto murders. Yeah, this is when the... I, not when the murders start, it's just when the murders really kick up a notch. Sutsumi Sakamoto was a lawyer who was well known for his willingness to take on cults. He was a guy who got results. He just just a few years prior to 1989, he had had a successful class action suit against the Unification Church, aka the Moonies. Sakamoto was effective in his techniques because he wasn't just like a very good litigator. He was a good litigator, but he was also good at using the press to his advantage. In his lawsuit against the Moonies, he encouraged demonstrators to show up at Mooney events and publicly protest them. And this would not only just strengthen the case in the eye of the public, but it would also negatively affect the Moonies' ability to raise revenue, thereby putting internal pressure and financial pressure on them. And this combined with the external pressure of the legal battle was an effective one-two punch that helped him get settlements in this case for his clients. In 1988, Tsutsumi Sakamoto founded the Coalition of Help for Those Affected by Om Shinrikyo. Uh, it's something else in Japanese, but that's the translated name of the coalition. Um, and he set up this coalition and he began using the same tactics against Om that he had been using against the Moonies. So these efforts were coming to a head in October of 1989 when Sakamoto went on the Tokyo Broadcasting System television to discuss the actions that he and his coalition were taking. Unbeknownst to Sakamoto, a producer from TBS agreed to show on the taped interview before it would air in order to allow them to prepare their response. On November 5th, Sakamoto... His wife, Sakato, and their 14-month-old son, Tatsuhiko, disappeared from their home in Yokohama. While Ohm was suspected, there was no actual implication of Ohm for many, many years. The, this family disappeared, middle of the night, uh, no trace of them. When police went in to investigate, there was an Ohm Shinrikyo badge on the floor in the house, which... Seems like evidence to me, but even with the presence of the badge, for some reason, the police were very hesitant to investigate Om. The police would not declare Om suspect in the disappearance, and police even went so far as to say 
that perhaps Sakamoto caused the disappearance himself in order to strengthen the legal case against Om and make them look bad in court, which is a pretty gross thing to say and definitely has nothing to do with the fact that some members high up in the police were members of Om. Under intense pressure from the media and the public, the police finally agreed to investigate the disappearance and ask Om leadership some questions. 16 days after the disappearance, Shoko Asahara declined to meet with the police in person. But later, he held a press conference where he, of course, denied that Om was disappear involved in the disappearance. He also claimed that the badge found at the scene was one of over 40,000 badges manufactured. This was a lie. There were 100 of these badges in existence. A tip in 1991 led to a renewed investigation, but this didn't lead to any new breakthroughs. And there was never a confirmation that the Sakamoto's had died until after the arrests following the subway gas attack. Correct. Following the gas attacks and police raids on the Om compounds, members confessed that they viewed Sakamoto's interview at the TBS station and following this viewing on November 3rd that Asahara had ordered the murder of Sakamoto. Members were unsuccessful in abducting him from a bus station, so early on the morning of November 5th, 1989, six assailants entered the Sakamoto house, injected him and his wife with potassium chloride, and then strangled them to death as well as killing their son. Um, despite uh, Sakamoto's pleas that their child's life be spared. Um, yeah. <sighs> yeah, that's... And there is... We don't know for sure, but it is usually suspected that Asahara was one of the six people that was there when this crime was committed. Their bodies were placed in oil drums and buried in three different rural locations, um, three different prefectures, in order to hide any connection between the three deaths if any one of the bodies was ever recovered. Ugh. Right. And none of the bodies were recovered until after arrests were made for the subway attack in 1985. Six years later, um, people who were arrested started to give up the location of these bodies to try to get leniency for the subway attack. Also in 1989, while this court case was going on, and around the time of the Sakamoto murders, Asahara and 24 other OM members ran in different Japanese political elections. They engaged in a absolute laundry list of illegal activities, including tearing down opponents' political posters and voter intimidation. But even with all of that illegal activity, not one of the 25 people running managed to win their elections. And this made Asahara really mad. After the 1989 election defeats, there was a profound and abrupt shift in Alm's religious teachings, specifically about the end times. The previous belief was if 30,000 people are saved through Asahara's teachings, it will prevent the apocalypse. The shift was they now believed that the apocalypse could no longer be prevented. It was coming no matter what. So from the BBC, Om Shinrikyo, often shortened to Om, believed that the end of the world was coming and that those outside the cult would go to hell unless they were killed by cult members. Cult leader Asahara styled the attack as a, quote, holy attempt to elevate the doomed souls of this world to a higher spiritual stage. And, quote, the, that is the BBC quoting the Japan Times. That is a major change and a major departure from christian-esque beliefs about the apocalypse and the afterlife it's certainly creative i am not sure that i've seen this idea before that an outsider's soul could be saved because they are killed by a member of a particular group is that it's related to manson family but is that the same as manson family i'm not sure I'm not sure either. I was under the belief that Charles Manson wanted to kill all those people in order to start a race war. Yeah, this is a first for me personally that being killed by a member can be a means of salvation. I'm sure it's out there somewhere in some other group. It's the first time I'm coming across it. 
Yeah, if we talk about Charles Manson coming sometime soon, then maybe we can... Uh, I, I'd be interested in doing that episode. I would too. So this wasn't just religious thought. It was backed by some religious sci-fi. Asahara talked in sermons about the modern weapons being deployed by the United States and other major military powers and described how his followers would be immune to them. He talked about plasma cannons, which are hypothetically a weapon that disintegrates people. And he said that everyone else would be burned by plasma cannons, burned to death. But his followers had such powerful spiritual energy that they would instead absorb the plasma and become more powerful. That is a mix mm. of sci-fi and religion that was really interesting to me. Now the teaching was, the apocalypse is coming, there's nothing we can do about it, killing people is good, and we're going to be okay in the apocalypse. It was this massive shift in doctrine that led on um, to begin developing chemical weapons and eventually led to their string of terrorist attacks. So publicly, his reading, his reasoning for a lot of these changes were changes in the geopolitical landscape. So following the collapse of the Soviet Union, Asahara declared that there would be a quote unquote final conflict between materialism and spiritualism. And I'm quoting um, here and he says, as we move towards the year 2000, there will be a series of events of inexpressible ferocity and terror. The lands of Japan will be transformed into a nuclear wasteland between 1996 and January 1998. America and its allies will attack Japan and only 10% of the population of major cities will survive. I don't know about you, but that sounds a lot like the kind of John Todd 1980. It's coming like the mm -hmm. New World <clears throat> Order. They're going to. Yeah, a lot of Christian rapture predictors or apocalypse predictors have used that kind of it'll be between these two dates. But he's preaching it to people who have a very strong cultural memory of not even 50 years previously being attacked by nuclear weapons. Like these people, a lot of his followers would not be old enough to remember that happening, but their grandparents certainly would, and maybe their parents would remember. That is maybe one reason that people believed him, because the people that he was preaching to were exceptionally vulnerable to that kind of fear mongering. So the shift from the apocalypse can be prevented if we do a good enough job to the apocalypse is coming and it cannot be stopped is actually more of a shift toward the end times beliefs that many Christians hold. It's important to remember that Om had specifically attracted a lot of intelligent people already in Japan. Some members that I read about were astrophysicists, genetic engineers, high-level chemists, and medical doctors. In 1992, Om spread into Russia. They gave over $14 million in cash, as well as computers from their computer company and other equipment to Russian leaders. And this gave them access to even more scientists, Russian scientists. And some of them would know how to make different types of biochemical weapons. And they brought that knowledge with them into the cult. You have to wonder how like the CIA or the PSIA didn't pick up on any of this because like I, I mean i guess recruiting russians made sense because there was a noted lapse of russian intelligence agency apparatus after the breakup of the soviet union and like the kgb is no more the, i mean it's wild that nobody was really like looking at this yeah they just they came in with a lot of cash and some free computers and the People who were in charge of the Russian government at the time were pretty about that. Later, it came out that Om had extensive wiretapping knowledge and capabilities. And there was a question of, oh, no, they gave us all of these computers. Does that mean that they're in all of our computers? Probably. This is not good. The subway attack in March of 1995 was not at all the first time that Om um attempted to do a big terrorist attack. Some of these earlier attacks had the plan of killing as many Japanese leaders, government leaders as possible. So here the plan. 
was create a power vacuum where many leaders were dead. And that will give Asahara a chance to rise to political power and become the new leader of the Japanese government. Uh, one of these early attacks, Om um, attempted to spray the area outside of Japanese parliament with Clostridium botulinum, it's botulism. Um, as someone who's been hyper-focusing on safe home canning lately, that struck fear into my soul because I know what can happen. I know what botulism does. <laughs> it makes your face not age. Uh, right. No, um, <laughs> seriously, I am, uh... <laughs> Sadie, if you ever plan on getting into Real Housewives, you're going to have to be okay with botulism. I, I would not mind getting it in my face. I just cannot get it in my blackberry jelly because, uh, seriously, jokes aside, if you contract, if you are infected by botulism, you can die from it. It is not the same thing as food poisoning, which is unpleasant enough, but rarely fatal. People get food poisoning all the time, and we really only worry about people dying from it if they're very old, very young, otherwise compromised health. Botulism is much, much, much more fatal and can kill perfectly healthy people. Like, if you get botulism from eating a bad can of green beans, you are going to be in the hospital for an extended stay and you very well might die. So anyway, um, don't get botulism. So this plan to kill uh, Japanese parliament members was a spraying mechanism mounted on trucks and then that would spray botulism toxin. The spraying mechanism worked, but the toxin was not formulated correctly and no one was killed in that attack. In July 1993, Om tried to release anthrax on the surrounding neighborhood around one of their headquarters by using a huge fan on the roof. This attack failed because they used the wrong strain of anthrax. And if they had used the right strain, they probably would have killed a lot of people. That's insane. It's a little hard to laugh about because it is so incredibly dangerous and there are multiple times that they just barely missed killing thousands of people, and this is one of them. But it also, it is a little bit funny because uh, they did try to kill a lot of people, and most of their attempts failed because of things like using the wrong strain of anthrax. Uh, on June 27th, 1994, Om was successful in committing a sarin attack against the citizens of Matsumoto Nagano, this attack targeted the homes of three judges who were about to rule regarding a lawsuit against Om. They released a cloud of sarin from a converted refrigerator truck uh, in the neighborhood of these judges, and they picked a day that was pleasant weather and people would have their windows open. It's really insidious. There was a very fortunate shift in the wind that dissipated this cloud more quickly than Om was hoping. This attack killed eight civilians and made over 500 people sick. The police did not investigate Om for this attack. They investigated one person, an innocent man who was only fully cleared months later. Wow. I mean, the, the corruption here and the unwillingness to even go near these guys seems... There's a lot going on. There is the, the respect for religion, the way that religion is treated in Japan. There is police members of the police who are involved in Om, which is corruption. There, there's a lot, and some of it is shady, and some of it is just cultural. I mean, so in 1995, police discovered taps on the phones of multiple critics of Om, but Om publicly denied tapping anybody's phones. They were tapping a lot of phones. Um, from 1993 to 1995, Om also carried out a lot of assassinations and assassination attempts. They would target people who were outspoken against Om or those who were helping others leave. They also assassinated current members who were believed to be disloyal. Many of these assassinations and attempts were carried out using VX gas or other chemical weapons or nerve agents. 
93 to 95 is also the height of kidnappings of members who attempted to defect. We've been leading up to the subway sarin attack. Let's go take up the offering and come back and talk about that. We are back from our break. And now I guess it's time for us to talk about the March 1995 Tokyo subway sarin gas attack. Okay. For starters, I'm going to give maybe a little bit of more information about what sarin gas is, how it works. So sarin gas is a chemical nerve agent that was synthesized by German chemists in 1938 in an attempt to create more effective pesticides. Like other nerve agents, sarin gas works by disrupting the neurotransmitters, initially causing symptoms like runny nose, but quickly estimated. Um, escalating to symptoms of pupil dilation, shortness of breath, uh, gastrointestinal distress, vomiting, and finally death by asphyxiation because your body essentially stops being able to control the muscles that make you breathe in and out. And so you asphyxiate and die. It is dangerous both if contacted in liquid form or if breathed in. It is 80 times more deadly than hydrogen cyanide and it is 500 times more deadly than chlorine gas. If it is directly inhaled in a high concentration, it can cause death within minutes. If it is inhaled or you are exposed at a lower concentration, it may still be lethal, but over several hours rather than within minutes. Um, there are antidotes to sarin gas, but they must be administered very quickly. And even those who get treatment in time may still suffer uh, severe muscle or nerve damage or seizure disorders for years to come. Exposure to nerve agents can also affect brain chemistry. So aside from the PTSD that survivors may suffer, suffer, survivors may also experience depression and other mood disorders for the rest of their lives. Yeah, not great stuff. Uh, under Ger when At the time that it was synthesized in 1938, there was a German law that any new scientific development that had military potential was required to be reported to the Ministry of War. After the effects of similar nerve gas known as tabin gas had been demonstrated, Nazis ordered a full-scale plant to be constructed where chemical nerve agents could be produced. The plant was finished in 1942 and manufactured gas is through the end of the war the idea was and this is like a horrible weapon the idea was that they would fill artillery shells with sarin gas and shoot them at the allies and fortunately for everybody these weapons were while they were produced they were like so many of the so-called wunderwaffe super weapons uh, that would uh, supposedly win the war for the germans their use was never given the final approval by hitler which very lucky. Uh, and during the end of the war, uh, captured scientists and facilities gave both the Americans and the Soviets information on how nerve gas is produced. And throughout the duration of the Cold War, both NATO countries and Warsaw Pact countries produced sarin for military purposes. Um, this is in spite of the fact that the 1925 Geneva Convention prohibits the use of chemical and biological agents as weapons. Um, because doing so constitutes a war crime. Sarin gas is considered to be a weapon of mass destruction. Just to be clear, we never used sarin gas, but we had lots of it for reasons of mutually, of mutually assured destruction. And sarin and other nerve agents and chemical weapons were used quite prolifically by people like Saddam Hussein against the Kurds. Uh, who are an ethnic minority living in northern Iraq. Uh, Saddam Hussein also used sarin gas against Iranians during the Iran-Iraq War. And after the end of the Cold War, in the 1993 UN Chemical Weapons Convention, 162 countries, including the United States and Russia, signed onto a ban on sarin gas production. And since that time, almost all of the stockpiles of sarin gas have been destroyed. Sarin gas does occasionally get used by despotic regimes multiple times over the last decade. Syrian dictator Bashar al-Assad has used sarin gas against civilian targets, and the death count from these attacks is estimated to be anywhere from around 300 to 1,700 people. In July of last year, the United States announced that it had disposed of the last of its stockpile of sarin gas, which is good because nobody should use this ad. Yes. I was not able to find a reliable number on exactly how much sarin gas Om did produce, but Asahi Shenbun, which is a 
very reputable Japanese newspaper claimed that cult members disposed of hundreds of tons after Jesus. the attack. So a lot, a lot. That, I mean, that's enough to kill th- thousands or millions of people. Yes. The, I have exact statistics further down in my notes, but there were enough chemical weapons and materials for making chemical weapons to kill over 4 million people. In the early morning of March 20th, 1995, at rush hour for commuters, five Om Shinrikyo members took packages containing sarin gas and umbrellas with pointed tips onto the subway. Kasumi Gaseki <clears throat> Station is the station located underneath some important Japanese government offices. Many government officials, as well as members of the National Police Agency, could be expected to use this subway stop to commute to work. So the attack was centered there. So five cult members got on the train at stops previous to that. And then as they exited the train, they left the packages containing sarin gas and punctured them with the umbrella tips and then walked off the trains. Commuters on board these train cars reported a strong chemical smell and then experienced the early symptoms of exposure to sarin gas. There was a lot of confusion in all of this. So first responders didn't initially know what had caused the sickness on the train. So many first responders to the scene also became sick because of exposure to sarin, either still coming up out of the subway station or on the clothes or skin of people who had been closer to the attack. Patients arrived at hospitals in critical condition, but the hospitals weren't aware yet of what had made them sick or how to treat it. Hospital workers were able to figure out that this is a contaminant of some kind and we need to decontaminate patients on the way in so that the hospital workers don't also get sick. But they didn't know what the contaminant was, so they didn't know what procedure to use to decontaminate. So the confusion and not the surprise of the attack caused more damage. This does give us a minute to talk about some really beautiful moments of humanity, though. The hospital that had treated victims of the earlier sarin attack in 1994 that targeted the homes of judges in Matsumoto figured out what was going on before some of the first responders in the hospitals treating patients had full information because they had seen these symptoms before. So they started faxing over treatment information. This is what it is. This is how to decontaminate. These are the drugs you need. There was a manufacturer nearby of a drug that can be used to treat sarin poisoning, and the manufacturer did not wait for government officials or hospital officials to ask for the drug. The manufacturer just started sending massive shipments of their drug to the hospitals that would be treating victims of the attack. The panic and trauma inflicted on Japanese citizens was very severe. However, because of the advanced air filtration system in the subways, far fewer people were killed in the attack than um, probably hoped. There were 13 people killed, and as many as 6,000 became sick. It's really unclear exactly how many people became sick, because some victims were hesitant to come forward, And also, some people who were not sick, some people who were not affected, were in the vicinity of the attack, and they thought they could be exposed. So they went to the emergency room thinking that they might become sick. So it really makes it difficult to tell exactly how many people did become sick. Two days later, the Japanese began, the Japanese police began a week of raids on multiple um, compounds and facilities. They found explosives, chemical weapons, labs for chemical weapons, labs for manufacturing methamphetamines and LSD, and millions of dollars of cash in United States dollars, prison cells still containing dissidents who had tried to escape the cult, and as I said earlier, chemicals to make enough chemical weapons to kill 4 million people. Prior to the raid, Alman Asahara had publicly denied any involvement in the gas attack. They said it wasn't us. Uh, two days after the attack is when the FBI actually finally launched an, an investigation. The leaders of Alm, including Asahara and people who actually carried out the sarin attack, 
were tipped off before the raid by their contacts in the government and the police. They were able to go underground, some of them for several months, some of them even for years in the case of some of the perpetrators of the subway attack um, before finally being arrested and charged with murder. So during these investigations, all members gave information that led investigators to the bodies of the Sakamoto family. They told authorities that they had been shown Sakamoto's interview at the TBS station. The TBS producer who had allowed Om to be shown this interview footage was fired from his job and the broadcaster was brought before the Japanese parliament to testify about their involvement with Om. TBS executive testified that they had agreed to show Sakamoto's interview to Alm leaders in exchange for getting an exclusive interview with Asahara. Additionally, the interview with Sakamoto never aired publicly, not even after his disappearance, and the ensuing investigation was making like national news. So like everyone was looking for this guy, everyone was wondering where he went, and they didn't air the interview. Yikes. TBS president Hirozo Isozaki at the parliament hearing said of Sakamoto, quote, he accepted the interview because he trusted us. We betrayed the trust not only of ourselves, but also of the entire broadcasting industry. Wow. And the president, that president ended up resigning. Yes. I mean, I, I think everybody involved ended up either resigning or, or was fired. Mm hmm. And, and one member of the parliament even suggested stripping TBS of their broadcasting license over this. That's fair. Yeah, I mean, I think so. Asahara and six other leaders of OM were finally executed in July of 2018. It took all of those years because they found, had to find and arrest all of these people and then all final appeals for each person were completely exhausted, and then they executed them as a group. <clears throat> One thing that really caught my attention doing this research, among a million things that caught my attention, is that the list of perpetrators is absolutely everywhere, but the list of victims is very hard to find. Here in the US, we are making a shift that I see as incredibly positive. When we have tragedies or mass murders here in the U.S., we are shifting to not using the names of the perpetrators so much and speaking the names of the victims instead. And that doesn't seem to be the cultural norm in Japan, especially 20 years ago-ish. I'm certainly not implying that one is right and one is wrong, but it is... It certainly appears to be a cultural difference because even the families of some of the people who were killed in the subway attack have not chosen to make the names of their loved ones public as victims. I mean, I think that makes sense, though, because like I feel like making the perpetrators famous and giving them their dark glamour, like that's how you get the Ted Bundy simps. That's how you get the people on TikTok. We're reading the Bin Laden letter and we're like, wow, this guy really had a point. You know what I'm saying? Mm hmm. And it seems like they don't have Son of Sam laws in Japan because some of the information that we have about how this attack was carried out come from the memoirs of uh, people who were made the chemical weapons or people who were involved in the actual attack and <clears throat> were arrested and went to prison and then wrote memoir about it. So, I, of course, I, we do have the names of all of those people, their getaway drivers. And listeners can easily find all of that in my sources for this episode. But I chose not to list them here for the reasons I was just talking about. I did find two names of people whose families chose to come forward and have their names spoken as victims. So I want to share those names in honor of those who were killed. One is Kazumasa Takahashi. Uh, he was an assistant station master at the subway station and he was killed on the day of the attack. The other is Sachiko Asakawa. So this is the woman who survived the original attack, but was left blinded and suffering from hypoxic encephalopathy, encephalopathy for 25 years after the attack. She died March 10th of 2020, exactly 10 days short of 25 years after the attack. I mean, this is like psychopathic stuff. I mean, do you think that they would have really been able to take power 
if the attack had been more so if they had been successful at killing members of parliament i kind of think no because the way that i view asahara I think he had an inflated view of himself. Sure, a lot of the things that we learned about in this episode show that he was clever, that he knew how to get people on his side. He knew how to drum up support and make money and get people under his personal control. But I just don't think he was quite the big man that he thought he was. I tend to agree with you. I think that after an attack like this... I mean, this attack didn't go as planned in that it didn't kill anywhere near as many people as it was intended to. Not a single one of their attacks went 100% to plan. When this attack happened, it I mean, it was just, you know, it, it was very unifying, like, no, we need to get these guys. Mm-hmm. Even if there was a transitional government, like if they managed to kill a lot of government leaders and there was a sort of transitional government, what, what, just like something short term, they still would have had the job of we need to get we need to get these guys unless enough of their people were placed in positions of power that they could be the ones assuming that power, which I don't think they had because they yeah. were trying to run for office and they couldn't make it. Though the thing that it really seems to me is that as powerful as they may have been, and as well-connected as they may have been, it seems like everybody who knew about them, most people f***ing hated them. So internally, um, could appear to be very organized. They were organized enough to create groups to assassinate or kidnap dissenters, defectors, lawyers. Uh, they were organized enough to commit terrorist attacks. But I, they were organized enough to have many different compounds with many different chemical weapons and m laboratories that created different things and a computer company and all of these things. I think maybe, and this is 100% my opinion, and not from any source. This is just what I'm seeing reading this story. I think maybe what they were missing was a hierarchy. I think it was just Asahara at the top and then some founding members and scientists in this next tier under him and then full-time members in the tier under that and then part-time members in the tier under that. I don't think they had an effective chain of command and I my just my gut feeling 100% my opinion i think that's where they had the ability to be terrifyingly effective in their absolute evil that they wanted to unleash on the world they had the potential to be effective to an extent that is very literally giving me goosebumps but they failed to be effective over and over again at reaching their own goals and my guess is they lacked a hierarchy. And from my study of cult leaders, my guess would be that Asahara wouldn't give up control. I think he was running the whole thing. He was taking on all of the administrative responsibilities and didn't want to delegate and didn't want to give up control. He didn't want to appoint lieutenants who could carry out his will over other people. And that's my guess on why they didn't do more, <clears throat> more damage than they did. My other thought is that if they wanted to, like, say, conquer territory and have territory that was controlled by them, Japan is not the country where you could do that. Japan is, is a country where there is a good sense of law and order, and it doesn't have the same lawless nature as other parts of the world where cult type groups are kind of allowed to just do their own thing because there's no real oversight see that's what i'm saying about asahara not that he wasn't clever and conniving and good at getting what he wanted small scale but asahara wrote before all of the extreme cultiness and murder. Asahara wrote religious books, kind of pop Buddhism kind of stuff. And his books were popular around the world. He sold books in the United States. I think if he were the big man, big brain genius that he thought he was, he would have moved the whole group to the United States or Russia. He had an opportunity to move to Russia. Actually, if he'd have moved the whole thing to Russia, then he might have actually been more successful. 
just because of what was going on in Russia yeah. in the early 90s. I mean, you could get away with a lot that you can't get away with in Japan. And that's where I'm coming off saying that those are the two ways that this group failed. I think he did not delegate and create an effective hierarchy. And I think he was not that he wasn't smart, but I think he was not the genius that he thought he was. Right. I mean, I, I sort of think of it as like if David Miscavige decided to run for president in America, there's no way he would get anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he could he could get the platform boots like Ron DeSantis, but <laughs> oh god, yeah. David Miscavige is famous for being very short. Yeah, that's that's my opinion. Om Shinrikyo went underground after the Tokyo attack, but they did not go out of business. They did not disappear even after the death of the execution of Asahara and other high ranking leaders. The group was sort of led by two of Asahara's preteen sons and remaining members. Eventually, the same group resurfaced with a rebrand. They renamed themselves Aleph, which is a reference to the first, the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet and is meant to symbolize new beginnings. <sighs> <clears throat> Sorry. Yeah, please leave us out of this. They appropriated mine more this time. If that makes you feel any better. I, I guess that does make me feel a little bit better. Um, they also lost their religious tax exempt slash religious designation, officially recognized religion mm -hmm. status. Yeah, apparently it's pretty hard to lose that status in Japan. Uh, they were under extreme surveillance by the Public Security Intelligence Agency from 2000 to 2003. And then the Public Security Intelligence Agency had to apply for a renewal of the ability to do extreme surveillance. They got the renewal to go through 2006, and they were able to strip Aleph of its religious status and tax-exempt status. Aleph is still allowed to practice in Japan under religious freedom laws, but they do not have the privileges of a legally recognized religion. The group has since split a smaller group has split off of the main group the smaller group is called hikari no wa which is translated as circle of rainbow light again a pretty cool cult name hikari no wa is headed by om's former spokesman and asahara's successor of fumihiro joyu and it was formed in 2007. Joyo claims that he has distanced his group from worship of Asahara. I don't know how accurate that is. But I looked it up. Apparently, um, Aleph now, it still has a thousand members, mm -hmm. which I suppose is down from their peak. But Which is, that's another thing that's hard to know. It is, I never saw an exact number of how many members they had at their height. I mean, what do you consider to be member? Do you mean like a full time member or or a guy who goes to the yoga meetings, but and maybe sits on an electric yoga mat, but doesn't you know worship a guy or buy his bath water or murder people? Or it could maybe were the people that were on the take from Om considered members? If Om Shinrikyo, under the name of Aleph or whatever name they use next, is designated as a terrorist organization both in the U.S. and in many other countries. But both Aleph and Hikari Noa are legal in Japan. They are designated as dangerous religions, and the government is allowed to conduct much more surveillance on them than they are religions who have the, the legally recognized status. And that is the story of Om Shinrikyo. Thank you guys for tuning in to this episode. And thank you, Jonathan, for... Um, <laughs> finding this one for me this was so fascinating oh i was gonna say if this episode caught your attention by all means check out my post of sources we host it on our patreon but all of my source lists are set so that you can access them from the patreon website even if you are not a member even if you don't give us any money even if you don't have a patreon account at all you can access it no matter what there is so much information in my sources that just did not make it into the episode. 
so many little details. So if this caught your attention, definitely check out that source list because you will find more. Next week, we're going to be talking about, are we talking about the whatever is going on with Girl Defined now? At this point, yes, we think that next week will be focused on Girl Defined and She Works Smart. The intimate wife. What the heck, Bethany Beal? She's, I mean, she's carving out a niche for herself. Um, Okay, but given what you sent me this morning, carving out, never mind. Yeah. (laughs) Anyway, thank you guys so much for tuning in. We're going to be uh, joining you every Monday. and make sure you tune in make sure that you check out our patreon for the extended and uncensored and ad free version of today's episode as well as um the versions of our other episodes you can join our subreddit and our facebook group for discussion those places are both called eden exodus thank you guys so much for tuning in um i've been gavi oh yeah i'm sadie and uh we hope that you guys have a great day Bye bye but old rolling river tide Peeled me in too many days No regrets, no confusion There'll be no pollution I'm so thankful I've decided To change my ways I'm so thankful I decided